Do you know the primary survey? Like, it's that simple. And so in the secondary survey, it's F through I. In F is where we get our first full set of vital signs. We have five interventions, and we facilitate family presence. Um, and that one tends to be tough, and I'm not real sure as to why, um, but that one tends to be really tough um, for nursing in general. Uh, and then we'll talk about G, giving comfort measures, H, which is our finishing up that head-to-toe assessment, filling in the holes where we haven't filled them in so far, and then I, inspecting the posterior side of the patient. But our full set of vital signs, that is blood pressures bilaterally, heart rate, respiratory rate, temp, along with that in our five interventions, you will have them on a cardiac monitor, you'll get a SAT on them. These patients get an NG tube, a Foley catheter, and labs. And we're talking about our truly sick trauma type patients. Of course, not every single patient that comes into the ER gets an NG tube and a Foley catheter, but um, those are our um, interventions. <laughs> labs. What kind of labs are we going to order? <laughs> Almost everybody gets a CBC and a comprehensive. Almost everybody. What does that tell us? It tells us a lot. Let's us know if there's an infection going on. It lets us know if they're losing volume. It lets us know what their electrolytes are. It gives us just a good across the board picture of, of a patient um, without being extensive. However, the rest of the labs come in as to what is their complaint? Is their complaint chest pain? What their complaints chest pain, what else are they getting? Troponin. They're getting troponins. Um, if they come in complaining of um, kidney stones, they're going to get your analysis. If they're coming in, depending on what they're complaining of is going to determine what else we order in addition to that. Um, but right off the bat, it is really your comprehensive, a CBC and a comprehensive is what most of these patients get. They have heart failure, they're going to get the BNP. They have um, just renal failure, we're going to see different labs. Or if they have liver failure, we may we may focus differently, but depending on, um, that comes just depending on what their complaint is, what's in their history, but usually just right off the bat, it is baseline com uh, CBC and a comprehensive on the patient. If they're female, they're getting pregnancy tests. Um, what is it, still less than 40? Is it still less than 40 or um, if they, yeah, less than 40. Um, they're getting, you're gonna get a pregnancy test on them. Um, so just it kind of depends on what the, the chief complaint is as to how specific you are with labs. And then facilitating family presence. And this one is tough because many times we tend to want families to wait in a waiting room or wait outside the room or wait in the lobby when in fact families should be at bedside. We know through research that patients do better with families at bedside, they have better outcomes, Decisions are made faster in the care of the patient when patient families are at bedside. And lawsuits are decreased and uh, we see fewer lawsuits when we have family at bedside. Why? We take the mystery out of it. We're taking care of a patient and we automatically tell the family to go wait in the room. What are they going to think? Something's wrong. What's wrong? What are you doing that you don't want me to see? What are, what are you hiding? There's automatically that defense or that curtain that goes up. It's like the mystery behind the curtain. What are you doing? Now, does the majority of the population know what we're doing to the patients? No, they have no idea. But what they do know is if we're working, if we're doing the very best we can to take care of their patient, if we're treating them like they're our own family, they don't really necessarily understand everything that's going on, but they are comfortable in the care when they see us at bedside and they see us working with these patients. Do you know how many complaints I get in administration on a daily basis from families that call and say that no one's been in the room to see their family? No one's been in the room in days. <laughs> now I know good and well that ain't true. <laughs> like you can't stay in a hospital and no one walk in your room in days. <laughs> I know that that is the fact. Well, However, why do they say that? Because no one's talking about them. Because either A, we didn't acknowledge the family, we didn't identify ourselves going into the room, or the family was waiting in a lobby 
in a waiting room in a hallway or not even present and calling, complaining because no one has seen their family member. Um, codes, that's a big one. Kills me all the time. Patient starts coding, what do we do? Kick family out. Kick family out, why? Are in the way? Are they truly in the way? No. Is there plenty of room in most of these rooms for a family to be? Why? why? Let's get down to it. Why do we keep family out of the room? Because it gets hysterical and they sometimes... They don't let me, let me clarify. Right. You won't get me out of a room. Let's just clarify. Okay? <laughs> right here and now. But no, let's talk about why we don't we keep family out of the room. Because it's comfortable. Us. Us? Is it about us? No. Nope. It ain't about you. It ain't about me. Check it's yourself. about... It's that, about the patient. That's what Dr. Bowles say. Check yourself. That's they, right. They it ain't about you. <laughs> it's not. Who are we here for? Okay. The patient. And so we tend to find ourselves, especially if you're not comfortable in the situation, removing the family out of that situation. Because they make you uncomfortable. That's on you. That's your problem. You know what I suggest to you? Is figure out how to get comfortable in that situation. Because we should not escort family out of the room if they want to be there. That's their choice if they want to be there. The patient codes and you look at the family and go, well, they have lost a heartbeat and they're not breathing. We're going to start CPR on the patient. That means we're going to be compressing on their chest. We're going to be valuing the patient. Would you want to stay or would you like to step out? Now, some families are going to say, I want to step out. Why? They don't want to see because it. they don't want that to be the last memory they have of their family member and inevitably it will it will come back and haunt them night day in and day out if that is what they're watching and they don't want to see it so they may say they want to step out and then you may have family members like myself and dr debose you couldn't cry over it why because we need to know that everything's done we need to see you working we need to see the situation. Um, most families don't know what's going on, but they know when you're working hard to take care of their family. Families, as long as they're not in the way, they are really, we should encourage them to be in the ranks. Now, Boards is going to ask you, and I'm telling you right now, Boards is going to ask you some way, shape, form, or fashion, do you want family in the room? And the answer is yes. You do. You want to promote family presence. You want them there. So how, well, how does that look? Patients coding. What can we do for the family? We can pull them a chair to the corner of the room, have them sit down. Why? To keep them from being patient number two so they don't hit the ground. Mm -hmm. Right? And then we just get somebody to talk to them. You typically have a house supervisor that walks in. That is our job. That is our job as liaison for the facility to stand there and talk to the family, to know when they've made a decision to stop the code, to know, let them know what's going on, to explain what nurses are doing at bedside. So have somebody talk to them. Just have somebody just, just explain what's occurring. You're going to keep the family much calmer that way by just talking to the family. Um, cuts, like I said, it cuts down on lawsuits. Patient families come to decisions much quicker as well. Had a little elderly gentleman who he probably was late 80s, if I had to guess, but he was very frail. Very, um, he might have been 80, 80 pounds soaking wet, but he had that little hunched back. He couldn't sit up straight. Um, he was complaining of some chest pain and shortness of breath above Troy. They lived north of Troy somewhere. Son, put him in the car, and when I say son, son was probably in his 70s, um, late 60s, early 70s. Put him in the car and was going to stop in Troy with him, and daddy wouldn't let him. He said, my doctors are in Dothan, I want you to take me to Dothan. And so, son, being the good son, kept talking to him, making sure he was okay, and decided, okay, well, just not take him to Troy because he wants to go to Dothan where his doctors, and he'll bring him, he'll bring him to Dothan. About Ozark, son reaccounts daddy going to sleep. And then he finally relaxed enough that he was sleeping. When they got to the ER, they called for a wheelchair. And I happened to be the closest person to a wheelchair, so I grabbed a wheelchair and went to the car to get him. And he was about this color. He was gray. Like, he wasn't even blue anymore. He was gray. 
Um, Daddy quit breathing about Ozark. He had not gone to sleep. He had probably died in the vehicle about Ozark. At this point, it is me, a wheelchair, and this frown little gentleman in the back seat. So what do I do? I pick him up, I put him in the wheelchair, and I wheel in the ER door. Since I'm walking in the doors, I say, I need some help, and we went to room one. And literally, we tear open his shirt, put him on a monitor, and we start coding this gentleman. My ER doctor walks out of the room and says, I need to talk to the son. Brings the son in. Why? Because we didn't need to code this man. He'd been probably dead since Ozark. He was in his late 80s. He was very frail. We start coding him. We are going to break every rib he has. By the way, he wouldn't even lay flat on the bed. He was so hunched over that we had to put pillows under his shoulders to support him, laying him on the, on the stretcher. Sure enough, son walks in the room and says, absolutely not. Daddy does not want this. Stop. Didn't we just probably, like, allowing son, by bringing son into the room, allowing a decision to be made for somebody to express the patient's wishes? Because otherwise, we are obligated to cope the patient until we know what their wishes are. So by having family there, we um, are honoring wishes that these, pa these patients have um, without having that barrier there of them being outside of the room. So we promote family presence. When we talk about giving comfort measures, we have lots of ways we give comfort measures. And by the way, your ER is your highest use of narcotics in any area in a hospital. Makes sense, right? Lots of patients. Many of them come in because they're hurting. We have lots of narcotic use in a, a, in the ER. We also have a lot of misuse in ERs as well. We will we see a higher instances of emergency room nurses addicted to narcotics than any other area of nursing because they have access to it. There we we have narcotics free flowing through ERs. Um, and so we have to think about giving comfort measures, but not only narcotics, we have to think outside of narcotics. We can't treat all pain with narcotics and take care of all their pain. A burn patient, you will never control all of their pain with narcotics alone. A broken hip, you might control their pain, but they're going to quit breathing on you because they're those elderly little patients that you're going to start giving them some morphine, and guess what? A little while later, they have no respiratory drive. So there's this balancing act between treating pain and keeping the patient breathing. So you have to think outside of just narcotics or pharmacological use. Neurotin's a great one. We probably don't use enough Neurotin. And Neurotin does very well at treating nerve pain um, and it not being narcotic use. Um, we use um, steroids. We can use anti-inflammatories. But then we can also think outside of drugs and think about things like situational. For example, I'll give you several. Six-year-old's been jumping on the trampoline, falls off the trampoline, and has a deformed right forearm. Comes in complaining of right forearm hurting, right? We can give them some narcotics. They probably need something for pain. What else do we do to that arm? We stabilize it. Yes. We put it in some type of gutter splint. We leave it stabilized, and guess what? If it's not moving, it's not hurting. What about our elderly patient, elderly male patient who had surgery yesterday, discharged from outpatient surgery. It's now noon the next day, and he hasn't urinated since about 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon. He comes in with severe abdominal pain. By the way, he's elderly, and he had to drive himself because his wife is at home who he is the caregiver of. What are we going to do for him? Are we going to give him narcotics? No, because if we give him narcotics, what's just happened? He can no longer drive, nor is he going to be able to take care of somebody else at the house. What does he need? He needs a Foley catheter. Put a Foley catheter in him, put a leg bag on him, discharge him home, and let him follow up in three to five days when his bladders woke up from anesthesia. All right, what about the elderly female who's fallen and broken her hip. We see a lot of those. We can give her some pain medicine, but it's not going to get rid of all of it. What are we going to do? We're going to put her in traction. 
put her in box traction, fatigue out those quad muscles, bones quit rubbing on each other, and guess what happens to the pain? Disappears. Sickle cell crisis. We have patients that come in with sickle cell crisis, and there is nothing fun about sickle cell crisis. These patients live with it most of their lives. Um, typically, it's joints. It's knees, hips, or, uh, elbows, shoulders. that many times had joint replacements. They have a high narcotic history use of uh, history. They require more narcotics than most patients because they have a very high tolerance to them. But uh, what else can we use along with narcotics to treat their pain? Oxygen, fluids, no, not cold, heat. We warm them up. We get them hydrated and we give them oxygen and we cut down on the pain of sickle cell. So not only are we looking at treating pain with narcotics, because we treat a lot of pain with narcotics, um, but we have to look outside of that as well. Kidney stones, we give them pain medicine. What else do we do for them? Fluids, why do we give them fluids? Because it dilates the ureters. We give them large volumes of fluids, those ureters dilate out and it helps pass the stone, um, but it also takes away some of that pain because that ureter dilates out. So think about not only pain medicines, but everything, what else we can do for these patients to control pain as well. Sometimes we need to explain that to patients, right? They wonder why we're not giving them enough pain medicine and say we are giving you pain medicine in combination with these things to help with the pain so that you still breathe for us. Because I need you breathing as well. All right, and then this is where we finish up our um, holes in our assessment, that uh, history and head-to-toe assessment. Because at this point, we kind of segmented what we have assessed. But remember, initial assessments are? That's primary. Nope. That's initial assessments are comprehensive and have to be completed by who? An RN. An RN. So initial assessments are comprehensive. Primary and secondary survey, primary survey alone is not comprehensive. Now it solves life-threatening injuries in the first five steps, but it is not comprehensive. And assessments, initial assessments have to be comprehensive and binary. So this is where we complete that assessment. This is where we go back and fill in the holes. This is where we do our grip strengths. We check maybe capillary refills if we haven't already. Or we might be assessing bowel sounds if we haven't already, depending on what's going on with the patient. <coughs> and then we inspect the posterior side. And we'll talk about inspecting the posterior side as we move into abdominal traumas, because the posterior side of the patient, lateral and posterior sides of the patient, can tell us a lot about what's going on in the abdomen. And so um, we'll inspect that posterior side um, of course, if this, the spine has not been cleared, we log roll the patient for the inspection of the posterior side. Some of the things that we look for on posterior sides. One is bruising, exit wounds or entry wounds for gunshots um, are some of the big ones that we look at the posterior side. We look at the spine. What does the spine look like? Um, if there's an abuse that's occurring, what kind of... Um, signs of abuse do we see? Do we see handprints? Do we see um, rope marks? Do we see um, cuts? Those type things on the patient. So we're just looking at the posterior side of the patient. So let's talk about um, trauma. We're going to talk about several different types. The first one we're going to talk about is crush syndrome. Um, essentially with crush syndrome, we have um, a large myoglobin release. So whether it's the fingers that have been caught in some type of equipment or toes or whether it is um, pressure or compartment syndrome or any of those type things, we have an area of large myoglobin release. We've had tissue injury, uh, muscle uh, damage done, and we have um, some type of crush injury. There's two things that we have to worry about that. One is locally we have to worry about the swelling. We have to worry about the distal perfusion. We have to worry about things like compartment syndrome 
when we have those crush injuries. But two, we have to worry about the renal system, the kidneys of the patient. Because myoglobin is that large molecule that causes acute tubular necrosis. That acute tubular necrosis leads to acute renal failure, which leads to chronic renal failure if we don't correct it. We've talked about this process already. We talked about it with electrical burns, when we have that large myoglobin release in the patient. So twofold when we are talking about crush injuries, we're talking about perfusion at the site or distally to that site, and we're talking about the renal function of the patient. So what do you think these patients require? Now, neither one of them are bleeding extensively. Like, do we need to control bleeding there? No, they need some sterile dressings put on them until they can go to the OR and get them cleaned up. But they don't need anything to re require re control bleeding. Do we re need to replace volume because they've lost volume? Do either one of those legs lost a huge amount of volume? No. So they're not hypovolemic. So what are we going to do for these patients? Do they need fluids? Yes. Yes, why? Because of the kidneys. Because of the kidneys. Absolutely. They are going to get large volumes of fluids, but it's not because they have lost large volumes. It's because we have myoglobin release and we have got to flush myoglobin through the renal tubules. So several causes of crush syndrome or causes of injury. We can see this with twisting, uh, work-related injuries we see quite a bit. We can see it with drug and alcohol overdose as well. Patients laying in odd positions where they actually cut the circulation off to their own extremity because of the way that they lay for an extended period of time. Um, and then falls. I had a little elderly gentleman who um, was vacuuming his house and decided he was going to move the dresser to vacuum. And his dresser had the top to it, and the top has a lid all the way around it that sticks out or, or past the dresser drawers. And so he was backing up, and he was shifting this um, dresser to vacuum behind it. And when he did, he lost his balance, and the dresser fell, and it landed on him. And that edge to that dresser landed just below his ribs and his abdomen. Um, and he laid there five or six hours, um, maybe seven, before his son got off from work and came to check on him. Of course, the uh, son got there. Daddy was alert and oriented, talking to him. They went to get the dresser off of him. They called 911. He called 911 to come help him because um, he figured he was hurt. Got the dresser off of him. He died less than 24 hours later mm -hmm. because it was compressing the aorta in the abdomen. So he had lost blood flow to the intestines, to his lower extremities, and essentially he had massive crush injury to the lower half of his body. Like when he came into the ER, our ER physicians told the son to be prepared that he may die in the next 24 or 48 hours. And sure enough, he did. And he came in alert and oriented, talking to us. But because he had lost blood flow to the lower part of the body, he just had massive necrotic tissue he had a massive crush injury. He had um, lots of ischemia. Uh, he did ultimately die from his fall. And it was on, in the house on carpet. Um, we can see, again, this whole process of we have to worry about perfusion locally, dis distally to wherever our injury is. Um, you can have compartment syndrome with crush injuries. Then you have to look at um, potassium, because where is potassium stored? In cells, we have large cellular damage. What happens to potassium? Release and moves into the bloodstream. So potassiums rise just like they do with our burn patients. So we have to worry about potassiums with these patients. And then we have to look at these kidneys. We have to keep them um, producing urine. We have to make sure that those uh, renal tubulars don't become clogged. So there is a case of compartment syndrome 
they just opened that leg up. They did a fasciotomy right there at bedside. Um, and why did they do the fasciotomy? For what? For sweat. The swelling, but not because of the swelling. The swelling alone doesn't cause us to do a fasciotomy. Tissue necrosis. Tissue, Tissue necrosis where? Distally. They do fasciotomies to provide perfusion distally because obviously he had lost perfusion to his foot. So we cut that skin open. We allow for that swelling externally to restore blood flow distally. So we use fasciotomies for perfusion, distal perfusion. We, give, we can give these patients diuretics. Why can we give this patient a diuretic, a loop diuretic, and we cannot give the burn patient a loop diuretic? Okay, so the diuretic will help flush potassium, depending on which ones you use, but what else? Does what now? Helps flush myoglobin, so we're forcing uh, we're forcing urine through the kidneys or uh, flow through the kidneys. But why can we do that with this patient and we can't do it with the burn patient? The burn patient is uh, because they're not hypovolemic. Absolutely, that is the difference. The burn patient is hypovolemic. Remember, their vascular volume's almost nothing because they are third spacing so severely. They have that capillary leak syndrome. Their vascular volume is dropped. This patient has not lost vascular volume, so we can give this patient a diuretic that we can't give the burn patient a diuretic. But is it still the same process? Is it still compartment syndrome? Is it still acute tubular necrosis? Absolutely. We've just got two different causes. One we can give the diuretic to, the other one we can't. So you have to understand the process you can't memorize, oh, I can give you a diuretic because you are in acute tubular necrosis, because that doesn't apply to everybody. So you have to understand why. k -exalate. Why do we give k For the potassium. For the potassium. How many of you work on a floor? How do you give k on the floor? Orally. Orally, right? Almost never do you give k in the ER orally. You know how we give k -exalate? Tension uh, enemas. We give it rectally, we put a Foley catheter behind it, blow up the balloon, and we let it sit in a rectal vault. Why? It draws out potassium much faster that way. So you may see k given um, rectally. Um, it was a retention enema. Dialysis, of course, we would love to put these patients on hemodialysis. Uh, again, filters out myoglobin, filters out the, um, some of the toxins. Um, those chemical mediators that are released, uh, same thing with the CRRT as well. But definitely we are doing fluids on these patients to hopefully keep these kidneys functioning. Blunt traumas or abdominal traumas, we're going to talk about two different types. We have a blunt traumas and we have penetrating traumas. Both of them are traumas to the abdomen. We're talking about abdomen specific. Typically our blunt traumas come from steering wheels or seat belts. It's typically, um, you can see it in contact sports, baseball bats. Um, you can see it with shoulder pads. We're moving into football season. We can see abdominal trauma with shoulder pads hitting in, in the abdomen of the patient. But essentially a blunt trauma, there's no break in the skin. Whereas a penetrating trauma, we have a break in the skin. We have something that has um, broken the barrier of the integumentary system at the, at the abdomen. We typically see with our penetrating traumas, bullets, knives. Um, I've seen fence posts, nails from nail guns. Um, you have occasional odd and end things, but most of it, when you see penetrating traumas, it, knives or gun uh, bullets. Um, I had a rock as a penetrating trauma. Somebody was on a jet ski at the river, got thrown off the jet ski, landed on the bank, and the rock went into the abdomen. Um, you have odd instances like that, but um, essentially there is a break in the skin. So what is the big difference in treating these patients? Do it now? 
No, they can both hemorrhage. You can one, hemorrhage with a one, one trauma. One has a bigger and, chance for infection. That's right, infection. So you're going to see infection much faster with a penetrating trauma than you will with a blunt trauma. However, can you still see infection with a blunt trauma? Absolutely. If you have a break in the GI tract and you have free air in that abdomen, then you have the potential for peritonitis or some type of infection from fecal material being in the abdomen. So both of these have the potential for infection. You typically see it faster with the penetrating trauma than you do with the blunt trauma. So what if we have a knife like that sticking out of the abdomen? What are we going to do with it? We we're going to keep it. That's right. Souvenir. Hold on to it. I'm just kidding. No, we stabilize it until they take, it, take them to the OR and remove it. Um, but we do dress around it. So when we are talking about these patients and we're assessing them, one of the big things we look for is hypovolemic shock. Because remember I told you that they can lose large volumes of blood in the abdomen, um, especially with these abdominal traumas. Um, some good indications of that is when we've, we've got um, some type of abdominal trauma is your Collins sign and your Turner sign. You see both of those there in pictures. Um, where you have either bruising around the belly button or you have bruising in the flank of the patient. That is one of the reasons that we log roll these patients because when there is abdominal trauma, especially when we have that um, deep abdominal trauma, we'll see retroperitoneal bleeding. So we'll see the flank of the patient bruise. And it's because it's pulling to the back side of the patient. That's why we roll them but a good indication that we have abdominal trauma. Um, of course, some other signs is pain. They're complaining of abdominal pain is a good indication of some type of trauma to the abdomen. You have a mechanism of injury. You have a car wreck. You have a jet ski or a boat accident. Um, you have any type of contact sports where there is a mechanism for injury is a good indication that they may have some type of abdominal trauma. Vital signs. Again, we have that patient that's tachycardic and hypotensive. Everything leads to low volume and you're not finding anywhere that that volume is leaving the patient. You need to look at the abdomen because they'll hide it in the abdomen very well. The abdomen at some point will get tight and distended with distant bowel sounds. They don't necessarily lose bowel sounds, but they become distant. It's kind of like, um, listening to, to bowel sounds through fluid because essentially you've got just that blood sitting there um, between the skin and the, the intestines. Um, we can lavage these patients. We can do gastric lavage. We can do peritoneal lavage um, to see if we have blood. We also put Foley catheters in these patients um, one of the big reasons is not necessarily for urine output, because that's usually the answer I get. Why do we put a Foley catheter in an abdominal trauma patient? Do it now. To, it lets us know if the, we have a bladder that's injured. Um, it also decompresses the bladder so that we have area to work with that abdomen. So we get the bladder out of the way. The same thing with an NG tube. We put an NG tube down to see if there's blood in the stomach. Um, but it also decompresses the stomach as well. Um, we will definitely put an NG tube in and a Foley catheter before we do peritoneal lavage. But what is peritoneal lavage? Essentially that. We put a needle into the abdomen, we put fluid in, and then we turn around and we draw that fluid off. What are we hoping to get? Just the fluid we put in, right? Clear, saline, whatever we put in. We put that fluid in and we get GI content back and we know that we have a perforation of bowel. We, get, we put fluid in and we get blood back, we know we've got a bleed somewhere. So what typically bleeds in the abdomen we have to worry about? It's not the intestines, intestines don't typically bleed too bad themselves. Spleen and liver are our two very bloody or um, vascular organs in the abdomen. Um, we see lots of, they call them liver lacerations or splenic fractures. They're just torn. 
They're bleeding. Sometimes they'll heal on their own. We leave them alone. Other times we have to take them to the OR and we remove the spleen or we cauterize the liver depending on where it is. Um, but again, notice down there on their interventions, it's exploratory laparotomy. We go in and we look. We got to find out what's going on. Um, and so they typically end up in the OR with abdominal trauma. Has anybody taken care of a patient during their ER rotation this semester that had an abdominal trauma? Well, I don't see a ton of, didn't you? We had a lot. We got, he was connecting his um, record to pull out a chicken coop thing and uh, Water got loose and came back and cut him on the head, abdomen, leg, so. Yeah, it's trauma everywhere, not just in the abdomen, but yeah. Um, they can be very, very sick patients, um, again, because of the hypovolemia. You have to worry about the shock side of hypovolemia with these patients. Uh, heat-related emergencies. Believe it or not, there are a ton of heat-related emergencies, and we don't see half of them in in the ER. So we're going to talk about heat exhaustion and heat strokes and the difference between those. Um, we actually took care of a patient in the unit this semester, this semester that had a heat stroke. Um, they were a classic heat stroke and I'll talk about the difference in your classic and your exertional heat strokes. But a heat exhaustion basically comes from dehydration. Now there's several ways or versions of dehydration. Here you typically, you're thinking manual labor outside in hot weather. And when we say um, environment that is susceptible to um, heat exhaustion, we're talking about days where we have temperatures greater than 95 degrees and humidity greater than about 80%. What is that, 300 of our 365 days here in South Alabama that we have the potential for heat exhaustion? But dehydration is the number one cause of heat exhaustion. So typically we think of uh, manual labor outside, not pushing fluids, not hydrating well, working in the yard, maybe not conditioned to it, um, and we see heat exhaustion. We can also see it doing absolutely nothing, laying by the pool, drinking a beer, enjoying the day, and guess what? Now you're dehydrated and you've still been and temperatures greater than 95 degrees, humidity greater than 80%, and you've still hit heat exhaustion, right? So we think manual labor, but remember it can happen in that environment with any type of dehydration. Being out on a boat, fishing, late, being at the lake, um, it can occur in any of those environments. We typically identify the signs of heat exhaustion. I mean, like, I identify them in a hurry. Like, walking from the building to the car, I'm like, woo, that's some heat exhaustion. I need to find some air conditioning and something to drink, right? But we identify those symptoms. We identify when we're sweating, when we get tired, when we get, start getting that flu-like, maybe achy feeling to us, and we stop what we're doing, and we cool ourselves off. We go get inside. We get in a cooler environment. We drink fluids. We get under a ceiling fan. That is us actually treating heat exhaustion and we never go to an emergency room. So lots of people experience heat exhaustion and may not ever show up in our ERs. When they do come to the ER, it is the, we do the same thing for them. We give them fluids, we check a few electrolytes, and, and then we'll keep them several hours, recheck those labs. If they're improving, we'll send them home. If not, and the, like they're our elderly patient and it's taking their sodium or their potassium a little while to recover, We'll admit them overnight, but it's usually very mild in stay. Typically, again, there's those flu-like symptoms, um, and we can treat heat exhaustion just by um, getting out of the environment and pushing fluids. If we have heat exhaustion that, we, that goes unidentified, it can lead to a heat stroke. And we're gonna talk about heat stroke as well. <coughs> So these are the interventions for your heat exhaustion. Again, cool, um, lots of fluids, just cooling off. Um, my granddad, my grandparents used to have acres and acres of daylilies. And did I have I told you this about my granddaddy in the water hose and he'd just walk up and down? But he would keep himself cool by wetting himself off with a water hose. So he was um, really preventing his heat exhaustion by wetting himself, hydrating himself, and being pro appropriately clothed for the environment. 
Um, the same thing that, that we do when we um, identify that we've hit that point. Again, exertional, um, or ex exertional heat exhaustion that is not identified can lead to one of our two types of heat strokes, our exertional heat stroke. And this is essentially a continuation of that. You're outside working in an environment, um, you don't identify the signs of heat exhaustion, and you move into a heat stroke. What is the difference? The big thing is body temperature. With heat strokes, their body temperature reaches 104 or greater body temperature. Now with that, when that temperature elevates, their body temperature is greater than 104, we have organ dysfunction. So we have a patient that moves into mites because their body temperature is elevated. The body is not designed to work with an elevated temperature of 104 or greater. So organs just start shutting down. They quit doing their job. That is why you will see treatment for heat stroke that is drastically different than treatment for heat exhaustion. We also can have classic heat stroke. And when we think about classic heat stroke, I typically think about your elderly patient exposed to high temperatures, high humidity over a long period of time, but there's no exertion involved. It's just an exposure of the elements. So if you think about the aging process, remember older patients don't have a thirst sensation the way you and I are get thirsty. We get a little dehydrated, we get thirsty, our mouths get dry, and first thing we do is we go get something to drink. They lose that thirst sensation. So this time of year, somebody's on a fixed income. They may not want to run or cannot afford to run the air, central air in their home. So they will, my grandparents were great examples of this. They grew up during the Depression, and so not that they couldn't afford to run their air, they chose not to run their air because they felt like it was too expensive to run their air. Um, and so they would get up in the mornings, they would get dressed, they would go outside, they might sit under a shade tree on their porch, um, under the patio. There's air moving throughout the day. There's some breeze. They're not doing a whole lot, but they're just literally sitting in the environment. But they don't have that thirst sensation. They're not pushing fluids, and most of them are on some type of diuretic. So they know if they drink, what are they going to have to do? Go to the they're going to have to go to the bathroom. So how many, patient, how many elderly patients have you taken care of that quit pushing fluids because they don't want to have to walk to the bathroom? Like 99% of them try to cut down on their bathroom trips by just not drinking, right? So here they are not drinking because they don't want to walk to the bathroom, back and forth to the bathroom, because they've had their water pill for the day. And they're literally just kind of sitting in that environment. It's hot, it's 100 degrees, cools off, the sun starts to set, so they're gonna go inside. They haven't run the air all day long, they've had windows up, they might have had a box fan in the window, there's air moving, but it is hotter inside now than it is outside when the sun sets mm -hmm. because of the lack of ventilation or of airflow. They change, they get ready for bed, and for the next 12, 10 to 12 hours, they are asleep. What are they not doing during that time? Mm -hmm. They're not drinking. So it's this perpetual extended period of time that they essentially are dehydrating themselves over usually days that we see the classic heat stroke versus the exertional. Exertional is usually pretty fast. They're out there working hard, um, sweating, not rehydrating, and you see exertional heat stroke. Classic tends to be um, a longer period of time they're exposed to the same conditions. There's just not the exertion involved. Um, so we typically see that classic in our elderly patients. Body temperature elevates, body no longer functions the way that it's supposed to, organs quit working the way that they're supposed to, and now what do we see? We see a patient in mods. They become confused. Um, they have that elevated body temperature. We start with all of these patients with airway breathing circulation. I've been talking about the specifics to the abdominal trauma or to the crush injury or whatever the case may be. But we start airway breathing circulation and then with these patients, we have to focus on that body temperature. We've got to cool the patient off. Um, so how are we gonna cool the patient off? It is different than that of heat exhaustion. These patients, we're going to remove their clothes, we're gonna put ice packs on them, 
And then we're going to use IV fluids. We give them nothing by mouth. So why do we not give them something to drink? It'd cool them off much faster. Because of the risk of aspiration. Because one, they may be confused and they can't swallow well. But two, remember the stomach is not going to function the way that it's supposed to. Because they're in mods. So they're, it's going to sit there until they vomit it back up. And now they're at a risk for aspiration. And then we're going to push fluid. But we're going to give IV fluids. But we give normal saline. We do not give lactated ringers. Why? That's important. Lactic acid. Because of lactic acid. Absolutely. The liver quits functioning. And the liver cannot metabolize the lactated ringers. And we have a buildup of lactic acid in the patient. We put them in a metabolic acidotic state by giving them like, um, LR versus normal saline. So only normal saline for these patients. They get nothing by mouth. But guess what? We have to worry about seizures with them. So you may see them receiving benzodiazepines to prevent seizures. And as we start cooling them off rapidly, what are they going to try to do? Shiver. Shiver. So we have to prevent shivering because if they start to shiver, what's going to happen to body temperature? It's going to go back up. We're going to be fighting ourselves by letting the patient shiver. So that's why we use Thorazine to prevent shivering as we're cooling them off. We can cool them lots of ways. We can cool them just with IV fluids. We can cool them with lavaging as well. We can put an NG tube in and it's called gastric lavaging, and we put cold water in, we set it, let it sit in the stomach for a minute, and then we draw it off. And we put cold water back in, and it's lavaging. We can do it with the bladder. We can put cold water into the bladder, let it sit, draw it off. Put cold water back into the bladder, let it sit, draw it off. That also cools the body temperature. You can even go to the extremes, and you can do peritoneal, and you can do thoracic lavaging, where you actually put the the cold fluids into the abdomen or to the chest cavity and draw it off. Um, don't see a ton of that, um, but it is a potential for cooling the patient off as well. <coughs> However, start dropping body temperatures. You can also have other problems if you get them too cold too fast. So just remember that. You can see brain <coughs> swelling on these patients when you see drastic changes in temperatures like that. Um, so we do cool them off, but we do have to be careful with doing that. We have to keep a close eye on that core temperature as we're cooling them off. Um, Cold-related emergencies. You wouldn't think we would have a whole lot of cold-related emergencies because we perpetually stay hot around here. However, we do have the potential for hypothermia or cold-related emergencies. So essentially, when the body temperature is less than 95 degrees, what do you think we see the most hypothermia in the hospital? Do I know? In the ER, the homeless, but that's not your highest population in the hospital. Post-surgical are your coldest patients usually. Why? They've been in an OR. It's a cold room. They've had large volumes of fluid. They may have had large blood loss. You would be surprised, no you wouldn't, at the number of patients that will come out of the OR cold. By definition, hypothermic with a core body temperature less than 95 degrees. When you rotated, the ones of you that got to rotate through recovery room or PACU, what did y'all focus on? Pain control was one. What was another one? Warming them up. Getting warming blankets on them. Wrapping their heads up. Putting these, some facilities have these little silver blankets. They're supposed to hold body temperature in better. Um, getting them warm because they can come out in a very hypothermic state. So yes, we see it in our ER, typically with our homeless population, but we can see it in the facility as well because we can cause hypothermia on the patient. But by definition, hypothermia is a body temperature less than 95 degrees. There are variations of that. We have mild, moderate, severe, profound hypothermia. Again, it's more on what we see in the patient versus um, a set definition of the temperature of the patient. Um, we, to prevent hypothermia, we have to think about correct clothing, staying dry, um, and knowing our limitations. 
And this one always cracks me up. Because how many people do you know around spring break gonna get on a plane and go out west somewhere and go snow skiing? Higher altitudes, not conditioned for the weather, and they're gonna get out there and they're gonna work like dogs trying to ski, stay upright on skis. And guess what, they're gonna start sweating. And when they start sweating, what happens? They get cold. That's right, we lose body temperature 25 times faster wet than we do dry. So these patients can become hypothermic and not even realize it because they don't know that they're sweating in cold weather. So you have to be mindful of your limitations um, in, in, those cold, in those cold weather uh, scenarios. People that are predisposed, some medical problems, usually those that are lacking shelter, appropriate clothing, and are malnourished, um, are typically the ones that we see hypothermia in. Again, we do tend to see this with a homeless population that we see hypothermia because they are lacking those resources. So like I said, we have mild, moderate, and severe Again, think about what happens in each of these versus the, the temperatures of the patient. We think of mild hypothermia. Um, we probably all experience some form of mild hypothermia. We start shivering, um, which is our body's way to try to correct it. Um, they're just starting to get cold, so we'll start shivering. Um, you may see some mental slowness with it, more so than confusion. Um, more, you can see confusion, but more so the mental slowness. You ask them a question, and you have a pause. They eventually tell you the right answer, but it, it's like you want to answer for them. Like you just want to pull it out of them because it takes them a minute to get it out. Um, can you tell me where you are? I'm in the hospital. Yeah, you are. That, but it's that mental slowness. It's right. It's just not coming out the way that you would think that they would be able to respond. You can also see what we call cold diuresing in these patients. And basically it's a large urine output because of peripheral vasoconstriction. They get cold, they have peripheral vasoconstriction, increases core by, uh, blood volume, better perfusion to the kidneys, and they diurese, um, which is cold, diu cold diuresing. And then in some instances, especially as you get to the cold side of that mild hypothermia, you start having a decrease in muscle coordination. But remember, they're still <coughs> shivering here. They're still trying to compensate in that mild hypothermia. We move to moderate hypothermia, and now we're going to see shivering that disappears. Now they're no longer compensating. We'll see a patient that um, can have the cognitive deterioration, they also have motor impairment. They will also call, uh, do what we call paradoxal undressing. And paradoxal is undressing is where they get confused. They have a false warm sensation and they'll strip. They'll take off all their clothes because they think they're hot when they're actually cold. Um, I love NCIS. There's a great episode of NCIS where the patient's body temperature, they were hypothermic, and they found them dead naked in the snow, in a snow um, bank somewhere, because they had that paradoxical undressing. They got confused and got this warm, false warm sensation and, and took all their clothes off. Of course, once they take their clothes off, they no longer have a barrier to protect them from the weather, from the elements. And so their body temperatures then drop drastically at that point. The colder the patient gets, the less that meds are going to work on them. So you have to think about metabolism because when they get cold, metabolism slows. And they also, we lose their ability to um, defibrillate these patients as they get cold. They'll start having depressed vital signs. And in profound hypothermia, they will appear dead and may not be dead. Like their heart rate is so slow, uh, even on a monitor they may look like they're almost in a systole, um, pressures are low, they're not breathing, uh, but they're extremely cold. The thing about that is you cannot pronounce them dead until their body temperature is at least 90 degrees. So you've got to warm them up to pronounce them dead. 
You have to be warm and dead. You can't be cold and dead. warm these patients up. Um, just like we talked about cooling off the patient that was uh, in some type of heat stroke, we basically can do the same thing to warm them up. We can use lavage. We can use peritoneal, gastric, uh, bladder lavage on these patients. We're going to put warm fluids in, draw it off, and put warm fluids back in. Um, again, we are going to warm them until we are at a temperature of at least 90 degrees. When metabolism slows, the thing about the patient getting cold, when metabolism slows, the oxygen and nutrients demand drops at the cellular level, right? If they're cold and there's no metabolism, do they have to have oxygen and nutrients? They don't. And so when they get that cold, they don't have to breathe as often because they're not requiring the oxygen demand. And so it's kind of a supply and demand type thing you have to think about because of metabolism. So that is why we warm them up before we pronounce them dead. Because they can, in that profound hypothermia, they can appear dead um, and not be dead. Because their, their metabolism has so slowed so drastically that there's not a demand for them to breathe. Um, there's not a demand for a heartbeat. Of course, they still have one. It's just very faint on the monitor. Um, you may not feel it in a pulse because of vasoconstriction, but they have one. Um, so different ways to rewarm them, again, depends on how cold they are. If they're just mildly hypothermic, do we need to lavage the plate patient? No. no. We are going to do least invasive to most invasive. So for mild hypothermia, you can think of um, active and passive rewarming that is warm blankets, warm environments, heating blankets, um, those type things. That's that um, external rewarming that we're going to do. We're moderate hypothermia, they're colder, <laughs> so we're gonna be a little more aggressive. We're gonna use not only external, but we can start using some internal or core rewarming. And then with our severe hypothermia, of course, we would want to warm the blood that's in the body and pull it out of the body, warm it up, and put it back in the body. Of course, that is extreme when we talk about um, mild, um, from least invasive to most invasive, that is extreme rewarming when you actually heat the blood up and put the blood back into the patient. Um, and so mild, moderate, and severe with temperatures is going to determine how aggressive you are in rewarming the patient as well. Frostbite is another one that we can see. In frostbite, we used to cover with um, burns. They moved it to the emergency chapter, but what we essentially see with frostbite was we identify them the same way that we identify our burns. We identify them as superficial, partial thickness, or full thickness burns. Um, they're just a little harder to identify because the tissue's not missing. The tissue's frozen, it's dead. Tissue necrosis is still there. Um, but it's a little harder to identify because it's not gold. When we had those full thickness burns with thermal burns, usually it was depressed, it was blackened, the tissue was missing. That's not the case with, with your frostbite or your freezing of the tissue. Tissue damage is still there, the tissue is just still intact. So we're going to rewarm those areas, but we have to use moist heat to rewarm the patient and we have to treat the pain. So they need some type of pain medicine to rewarm an area. We do not use friction. So we're not going to take her their little cold fingers or their cold toes and go, oh, your hands are so cold, let me warm them up. What are we doing? We're just causing more tissue damage um, with friction. So we use moist heat to rewarm these areas.
All right, so this first picture is 24 hours. This is the same foot six weeks later. Now you really truly see the necrosis, the dead tissue that's there. Um, again, in that first picture, you just don't see, realize that it's dead because the tissue is still there. But if you truly look, you can see at the ball of the foot, the white patching that's there. You can see how as you move up the ankles, you start to see blisters. So it's, that's that partial thickness versus the full thickness. Um, it just takes six, about six weeks for it to present itself. Now, those feet have been debrided, and they need lots more debriding. There's still lots of dead tissue there. You debride slowly because you only want to take off the dead area. You don't want to take off anything that's still viable underneath it. And if you just go in all at once and you clean it all off, then you're probably taking good tissue with it. So you give it a chance to present itself. That's why many times with debriding, whether it's with infectious wounds, whether it's with burns, whether it's with frostbite, debriding is done in stages over a time period. It's multiple, multiple um, debridement sessions. You don't just do it all at once. And so that you can identify what is truly going to survive or what's not going to survive the tissue that's there. Yes, sir. Um, as far as the rewarming part, uh -huh. uh, I know in our book it said like 99 to 102. Is is it specific as far as tip? Uh, yeah, you just don't want to get it too hot because you don't want to cause burns. Okay. So it's that lukewarm. I mean, that's warm to the feel, but you don't want it hot um, because you don't want to cause any more damage than, than they already have. Okay. Yeah. And then drownings. What time do we get done? <coughs> okay, we'll cover drownings, then we'll finish here at drownings. Um, unfortunately, we see lots of drownings. We have the potential for lots of drownings in the area. And so when we talk about drownings, we've got to talk about the health promotion and preventing drownings. Um, we're talking about a very specific population when we talk about drownings. We're talking about boys between the, um, between the ages of... Less than six, I think, is what it is. Hold on, let me just verify that. Five, younger than five. So boys are five times more likely than girls to drown. And 40% of them are younger than five years of age. So when we talk about drowning victims, we're talking about a very specific population. And unfortunately, when that patient comes in, especially that child, are they our only patient? No, we have an entire family. We have a mother, we have fathers, we have caregivers, we have grandparents, we have siblings that we also have to address the care of. Um, drowning. Ultimately, what do we have as the cause of death with drowning? It's hypoxia. How do we get there? Salt water versus fresh water. It's a little different. We'll get into that in just a minute. Um, but we've got to think about ways to prevent drowning. Um, teaching children to swim. One of my biggest fears as a parent was that I would have a child that would drown. I was a competitive swimmer. I played water polo through college on a women's water polo team at Auburn. I can swim. I can save you. Um, but my biggest fear was that I would have a child that would drown, um, that they would get out of my sight, I wouldn't see them, they would end up in water. And so I made sure that both of my kids could swim. They are both on the swim team. Um, and so neither one of them like it. But they do it because mama said that they had to because I wanted to make sure my kids were safe around water. Um, when I came out, at, well, when I was in high school and when I came out in college, the only job I had prior to nursing was I was a lifeguard and a pool manager for the city of Dothan. So um, I grew up lifeguarding. I grew up taking care of uh, watching kids around pools. Um, and inevitably, nevertheless, these boys were usually about five to eight, though, um, you know, I would say old enough to know better and still too young to care. No, they weren't old enough to know better. They just were too young to care. They would dare each other to jump into the deep end of the pool when they knew they couldn't swim. <laughs> now, does that make good sense? No. But obviously for five to eight-year-olds, that sounds like a great idea. Because they would. We would know they couldn't swim. They'd come to the pool every day knowing they couldn't swim. And they'd take off their life vest and they would dare each other to jump in the deep end. 
And so, and they're boys. But it was always the boys, it was never the girls. They were always at the shallow end with their vest on. It was the boys. So what did you do? You always had to go in after somebody, and then when you got them out of the pool, and they were choking on water and about to just <laughs> throw up on the pool deck, you have to talk to them about not listening to dares and their friends. Um, but teaching these kids to swim, diving is another one. Diving into shallow water or not knowing the depth of the water um, is a big one. And then avoiding alcohol around water. Um, because as an adult, alcohol slows our reflexes. It slows our cognitive ability, which is great sometimes. We enjoy that property of alcohol. But it prevents us from reacting as fast when somebody is missing, when there's a child at the bottom of the pool, when you're supposed to be observing water and we have drownings. I've taken care of multiple drowning victims. All of them were boys. All of them were boys. And my oldest one was eight. That's how, that's that age range that we've taken care of. Um, so what do we do for these kids? And let's talk about that. Um, hopefully we can prevent drownings because it is sad when they come in. It is not just the patient we are caring for. It is by far the family as well. Hypoxia is the cause of death. <laughs> they are not breathing. Their organs are not be getting the oxygen it needs. When we talk about fresh water versus salt water, they work just a little differently. Fresh water um, washes surfactant. It comes into the lungs. It washes surfactant. Um, and makes the lungs less compliant, and so then we have the uh, hypoxia that occurs. Salt water draws water into the lungs. So it gets salt into the lungs, it's high concentration, it draws fluid into the lungs. Surfactant is still washed. In both cases, surfactant still washes. The lungs become less compliant, alveoli collapse and stick together, um, and they basically we end up with a hypoxia that occurs. We have better results from drowning if the patient is in cold water versus warm water. And we just talked about that. With cold water, their metabolism slows. So if we can drop their body temperature and drop that metabolism, slow that metabolism, we drop an oxygen demand. Well, they're not supplying oxygen because they're not breathing. So we have closed the gap between supply and demand if they're in cold water. Whereas if they're in warm water, that metabolism stays high, that oxygen demand stays high, but there's no oxygen supplied, and so we see a bigger gap much quicker, and so we see poorer results in the patient. So they're much better, we have much better results in cold water than we do warm water. And then we also have to think about chemicals, cleaning chemicals, mop buckets, toilets with bleach tablets in them. Um, uh, bathtubs with shampoos, um, all of those we can see chemical burns on top of the drowning as well. So with these patients, of course, uh, spine stabilization depends on the circumstance. If it's an infant in the bathtub, do we have to worry about their C-spine? No. If it's the adult that has just jumped from a cliff into the lake, we have to worry about their C-spine. Um, and then it is airway breathing, and again, that's usually your problem. It's airway and breathing for these patients. Um, when they've been in respiratory arrest for so long, they move into cardiac arrest, um, but it starts with airway and breathing. We've got to correct the hypoxia in the patient um, if, we're going, if we're going to get them back from the drowning. With ventilation, their lungs are not compliant. We have to put PEEP on these patients. Because they've lost that surfactant, they are hard to ventilate. We have to keep those alveoli open. We have to put them on PEEP on a vent uh, so that they are oxygenated. And then, of course, if they are hypothermic, we'll treat the hypothermia. Um, and we do decompress the stomach because they come in with their stomachs full of whatever they were in, the pool, bathtub, lake, whatever it is. Um, we do treat that. And that covers our first lecture of um, emergency nursing. We will pick up on this on Thursday. I should see all of you this afternoon.